red and yellow, pink and green, purple and orange and blue, UK artist Tansy Hagen works the rainbow and explores the whole spectrum too. Listening with her eyes, listening with her ears, observing everything she sees, Tansy has been a keen investigator of her surroundings from an early age, learning to stitch before she could write and creating detailed diaries as a child. With a master's in landscape architecture, Tansy has taken her observational skills to work on textiles and paper. Her work explores the many parallels between textiles and the processes that shape a landscape, describing her mixed media palette as an allusion to the materials and mechanisms of landscape. Both are layered and adapted, diverse and inventive. Tansy has an incredible ability to absorb all the information about a place, filling up multiple pages in detailed sketchbooks. From notes about plants, the play of light, sounds, all the senses are involved in recording what she sees, taking in more than just the view, becoming more about what she finds. Indeed, taking the viewfinder to a whole new level. As her art practice takes up more of her working week, her tiny thumbnail sketches, vibrant swatches, rows of extracted shapes and abstracted forms, layered and reworked textiles, make up an envious grid in every way. Hot pink plays perfectly with pea green. Tiddlywinks and pickup sticks are reinvented in a visual form as her playful and quirky approach to creating are explored in her work. The colour combinations are exciting and unexpected and are generously shared on her hugely popular Palimpsest Parade Instagram account. Tansy's work makes us wonder and gaze in awe, so let's delve into the layers get beneath the surface and find out more and welcome Tansy Hagen who joins us from her home in the UK today as this week's Friday feature artist. Welcome Tansy and here we are. Hi, wonderful to <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you and welcome to everyone tuning in. Um, hopefully we're crossing several time zones uh, so thank you so much. I know a lot of people were keen. Um, I will just rec uh, recommend, obviously they're here. I will just welcome a few people. Um, thank you so much for joining and it's great to have you all here. So, wow, this is fantastic. Earlier in the week, uh, we had met and we were talking for the first time and we were talking about how we were both brownies, girl guides, I don't even know if that's still a thing, in the 70s and how we both had our thrift badge and our collector badge and I was thinking, I wonder now if they have like a small business badge or a podcast badge, like I wonder, <laughs> I wonder how the brownies have like moved with the times. But anyway, that's not a question so don't even answer that. So <laughs> Unless you've got thoughts. So I remember when your Technicolor swatches and thumbnails started appearing in my Insta feed. And one of my thoughts was, wow, like what is this person's backstory? Then the words landscape architecture made me go, oh, I get it. But I mean, I don't really know whether that's a thing. So how would you say your work as a landscape architect has influenced what you do? Um, I would say it's absolutely pivotal, not just as a landscape architect, but um, going back to my first degree architecture, I think that when you are improving places for people and, and wildlife, and I consider architecture does that as well as landscape architecture, or can if it's, um, you know, if it's being placed correctly, um, you're looking at details uh, at the micro and the macro and automatically you get patterns so you start you spot forms um, when you're a designer and if you are translating those in in the back of your head or in your sketchbook on travels into um into small works like um this sort of thing or this sort of thing then it, the the patterns from nature will influence you so it's a kind of collaboration um, between you and what you're observing as a professional. I don't know if mm. that answers. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that, that does indeed make sense. And so then going back, what came first for you, like stitching, sketching or writing, and do you have an earliest memory of one of those? 
it was construction. It was putting things together, mm -hmm. um, using the materials that were around me. So my, both my grannies were knitters and stitchers, although they had different jobs. My dad was an engineer um, and a civil servant, but he was a wood turner. Um, my mum used to make, she was a dentist, but she used to use her dental equipment to make tiny silver furniture for um, the doll's houses. In fact, not even. Oh. <laughs> she, she's still got them. They're absolutely amazing, tiny scale, maybe one to 50 scale rocking chairs and things. They were actually too good for my doll's house. They were like the kind of things that you'd see on a, on a charm bracelet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she did casting. And so basically I was surrounded by things to put things together with. So I would pick these up. I wasn't really interested in pens and pencils at first. It was about physically experimenting with if I use this material, this, this strand, whether it was a dried out chive leaf through an embroidery needle and stitching leaves together into egg boxes or whatever. That, that's where I started. And I think that using a pen and recognizing letters and words and being interested in writing and reading, that was quite delayed because I was so distracted. You know, Meccano was, I was the middle girl between two boys. We were born like, you know, about as quickly as three children could be born. And they had um, Meccano and, and Lego um, and, I had dolls and things, you know, it was the 70s and we were given um, sexist <laughs> gifts, but they all came together as, yeah. um, as a of toys. So we kind of um, together played with them in a, um, you know, in that kind of experimental, investigative way. Mm. So. And so I'm sure that most people tuning in or watching this afterwards will be familiar with what you do. Um, and <laughs> those few people that may not be so to me first of all I'll just kind of show this to me is you in a nutshell um that mix of color and shapes and and the sort of the small and the various and all of that sort of thing but if we wind back to um you sketching I mean the uh, where you say that um your sketching is a direct response to where you are. So on trains, outside in nature, sometimes uh, represent representational, sometimes on the road to abstraction. Do you think that the constraints of the viewfinder, those shapes, whether rectangle or square or circle, help? And when did you first have this realisation of, of drawing in a constrained shape? I was shown um, a viewfinder in the first year in architecture at the same, it was the same week I was shown a sketchbook. It was um, an architect who worked as an external teacher. So he was very much a busy architect running jobs. And he held up this sketchbook and he said, if I do my job right, this will be part of your brain in 30 years time. And he did his job right, absolutely. But he also showed us how to use a viewfinder. It was just a, a torn hole in a train ticket. And he said, what the viewfinder does, and this is exactly what I find. And I think I have a very busy brain. I'm, I'm really productive, but sometimes that can be overwhelming. And when you are like that, or even if you're not naturally like that, if you are set a task of doing something like going to a site and absorbing everything um, which is what we tell our students to do on landscape visits. Using a viewfinder helps you to just focus, zoom in on one thing at a time. And it reminds you to, to look up and just capture what's the proportion of sky we can see at this point and, and to look down and to, to get down on your knees and, and look at the, um, say, some moss and stones and I think that's the thing about the viewfinder. So yes, it is a constraint, but it helps to be constrained. It, yeah. it means you can compartmentalize. And then when you, when you do that, you can see the wealth of detail. You can pull things out of the um, sort of cacophony of visual stimulus. Mm. It worked for me. So. And I've got a couple here. I mean, that's also really interesting too, the, the translation of that, because 
that was similar to my experience because I did do one of your thumbnail online sketching courses and my sort of bush near to home was a bit like this and you sort of think, well, that's good, but how do I put all that information into this tiny little hole? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You're not necessarily putting all that information. So yeah. sometimes it's about, um, so that particular sketch, I remember, and that's the thing about using physical tools when you're out sketching, not just walking around and taking photos with your phone. Involving your sense of touch and your balance and, um, um, you know, listening to, to what's going on behind you. You know, if you're in an urban woodland, you're, you're wanting to stay safe, so you turn your headphones off if you're listening to music. All of those things contribute to really pinning the experience into your brain so that when you come back to the studio and you're wanting to say, okay, what, what do we take from that? How are we going to use that? Whether it's about making... Um, steps into textile art or um, improving that space for people as a landscape architect, um, your memory serves you much better. So that experience was about the complete immersion. I couldn't see sky at all. That was, um, I think that was in May when I filmed that and I did that sketch and I went on a journey and I described how um, how I was seeing the landscape and recording the, um, you know, just the, the simplest expression of what I was taking from that, you know, whether it was about um, an emotional response and, and, you know, filling my lungs with something and feeling uplifted or feeling slightly um, intimidated by being um, overshadowed by the trees. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I've got a couple of other ones as well. So just... Um different interpretations, that, which is, you know, the interesting that um, obviously it's a bit more about the macro and the close-up and not the scene and working in negative, positive or black and white is a variation. I mean, and then, <laughs> yes, I, I love that. So what do you think the biggest challenge of thumbnail sketching is that you hear sort of people um, feedback or comment to you? on um one of the repeated things is the eyesight so when you are looking <laughs> into the distance at something like, so but, true. yeah it is but I, I i have i've got pretty rubbish eyes um and i find that if you are trying to make the effort to look into the distance and then refocus close up in a way as if you are reading what's in your sketchbook, then that's too much effort. And also it makes you really focus too much on your drawing. So I find that mm -hmm. I'm only looking at my drawing with my peripheral vision when I'm looking yeah. at distance. I don't adjust my focus constantly. I'll only adjust my focus maybe twice in one per, per thumbnail. Mm -hmm. uh, so no, that I, is so I, interesting and that's kind of like I imagine like that muscle thing of developing that because you're going through the viewfinder so you I mean do you use one eye because I guess you kind of have to to look through a viewfinder well and yeah. then sketching you're sort of like am I looking there am I looking there but it's also in that you know when they do art classes where the continuous line drawing and you don't look at the paper exactly. you look at the thing so I guess it's that similar type of exercise it is exactly, and it makes it much quicker, and you don't look and agonise about what you are, what you're actually drawing. I will maybe look if I am changing my pen, and I want to get the placement of my my new colour onto into the frame, and then I'll look back, and you know you can see I go over the edges. They're not pristine drawings in any way at all, but they. What's going on when I'm making the drawings is is actually between my brain and my eye and my subject, that is the more important outcome, is that I'm, I'm making observations and I'm making decisions and I'm thinking about what I'm seeing. And also, I'm feeling the, the breeze on the back of my neck or I'm hearing a conversation over to my left or maybe a train in the distance. And using a frame of views, there is a margin where Sometimes I'll be writing about what I'm, I'm seeing. 
sometimes I won't write at all until I'm on the train on the way home and sometimes I'll write quite often I do I'll, I'll do little arrows about um, you know girls screaming to the left or um, the the train to Bamford is over my right shoulder or, or whatever um, so that's also that could be a train one yeah that's on a train from um, uh, Port Sawyer down to Parma in Mallorca it's a an old wooden train with full yeah. open windows. Yeah, it's not quite British Rail. And then, no, no. Uh, <laughs> and some of these that notations and and also the variation of the shapes too is interesting. So it's not always square or rect rectangle landscape or portrait. Mixing that up. Yeah. So the bits of paper there, um, up at the top right of the viewfinder, they're covering over all the apertures. But if you are looking through a horizontal rectangle, then you'd want to be, that is ratio, say, two to one, um, you'd want to be drawing into a frame that's that same size. Um, yeah. You know, so, and I like to experiment because in my, in my larger art, I like to experiment with, um, like Gustav Klimt's landscapes were, um, a ratio of seven to eight so almost square but just a bit squat and that's something that I like sketching in so it looks like a square but it's not quite a square and it makes you consider proportions differently a lot of landscape is about um, a horizontal line the sky and the earth below and then variations of that if you are in a valley that's cut out and mm. you know considering topography is is easier when you've got a horizontal and a vertical to align that with whether it's about looking through the viewfinder or making notes on your page mm. and so here's another couple of sketches and I was when you were talking about um, making annotations um, at the side or the margins or whatever, so and you were talking about um, often making notes about sound, do they translate into actual shapes or do they remain as purely observations to remind you of the scene? They do translate into shapes. So the, um, yeah, what you were just looking at there, I just... I've dropped them all on the floor, but <laughs> um, okay. this might be quite interesting for people to see. So that is the the sketchbook that you were just. Mm -hmm. And so these are really these are like diagrams, the sort of thing that a botanist might might draw in a laboratory. Um, just just the really basic shapes of um, of what they can see of plant parts and um, say a, a bee flies across so that would be about the movement the the route taken by by an insect um, or the the sound of something I will actually add that in so it might be a line coming across it might be um, some peppered marks from whichever side of what I was drawing is um, is there and was that, I mean, that because uh, you just, you know, mind blow, because I was kind of thinking like when I was listening to some music and you've got that sort of um, repetitive beat, you know, sort of making those staccato kind of marks. But then I thought, how do I mix that up? So to make shapes out of all these varied sounds, is that just something that over time you've just learnt to um, come up with new ways of interpreting sound into actual shapes and a visual response or were you just always doing that <laughs> um my immediate response I think I probably was always doing that yes it's, it's something that everybody can do if they just just sit down and and you know you can you can hear words that people are saying and write them down as lines that make sense don't we and that's way more complicated than making a mark. So it could be that I learned to read music at quite an early age. Mm -hmm. um, not in a very impressive way at all. My mum was a fantastic pianist and not one of her three children um, 
really you know mastered anything at all but we did learn to read music and that is musical notation does involve um, mm. the music um, in both directions so you will um, take a pen and write on a um, score um, and then also in the other direction you'll have to read music mm. um, yeah, and my limited um, knowledge of music. Also, you've got the building of the sound, don't you? From quiet, from soft to loud as well. So you're conscious of the sound coming up as well as it sort of moving, which is interesting. And it's yeah. absolutely layered, which is mm. what um, a little bit like the drawing something from life and then adding the um, the abstract marks that are your interpretation of sound on top of that that's what you were saying is um how do you do that it's just like music it's you know maybe a composer might think um we want you know he wants to have the sound of um of of a dragon um with the the hard heft of rock underneath it and that will be two sounds laid over the other um, yeah and i think textiles and landscape and music they are all about layers and um, making notes in that way, that's just like drawing, um, using one coloured pen over the other uh, mm. in making and notes. while we're talking about senses, so I was fascinated when um, in one of your courses you shared that um, you have synesthesia. And so for someone who's not familiar with the term, can you tell us what that means for you, how you experience it? Um, it's about... Uh, for me, it's it's about colour, and it's really it's the whole spectrum, and it's it's really nuanced differences between colour. So it's not just this is red and this is blue. Um, it's it's very slight tweak. So I can actually picture the picture a colour when I'm tasting something or I'm having a conversation with a new person, and I think it's me translating experiences into my own understanding my own language maybe it's um sometimes it's a comforting thing um because I'm quite I am an introvert um in in lots of ways and I think that color is my um is my comfort blanket in a way um but also I think it's about language so going back to what I was saying about words and um and reading color was color came before anything you know, real investigation. I can remember being in the garden and picking lots of petals and organising them into colour. This would have been, you know, not long after I could, um, I was able to remember what I was doing. I was playing with colour and really examining the, the tiny differences. So I think using colour in that way has, um, you know, it's, it's, all, it's all mixed up. I don't know if one is born a thinnest or you become a citizen. <gasps> I could uh, this whole time. <laughs> yeah, but my gran, one of my grannies, and my my mum to some extent, but not as much as this granny, and then my daughter, um, we all have this same colour synesthesia. So um, I think it is a little bit of a, a hereditary thing. Yeah, I think it is too. And so have you thought of it as, I mean, you might not have even thought of it this way, but do you see it as a gift or has it been a hindrance at times? Like, is it too much overload of everything? I think it's both a gift and a hindrance. It's definitely been a hindrance when it was, when I was um, learning to read age, whatever age we, we learned to read, five, I guess, yeah. six. Um, I can remember being really, really frustrated with just black words on white and um yeah I had to trans turn things I had to start using different colored pens and I have read studies in um uh on university websites where it's a uh, a functional um disability that it's been described as that you know it does hinder um certain functions I can remember then being a master's student and experiencing the same problems with um reading heavy texts and it was only when I remembered oh yes I can use colour that helped me understand so yeah it can be annoying mm -hmm. but I yeah. definitely you know I exploit it to the full so that's great yeah um, 
when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, I wish I had that. But then when you go <laughs> deeper, you think, yeah, that must be really hard trying to block things out at times when you've got more information coming in. And it, I imagine, and as a young person, it would be quite confusing too, I expect. Mm. Yeah. So moving on to the swatches, which just the way, I mean, I just love so much about them and um, how, well, I, I guess asking you how you abstracted them is almost like, well, you've kind of said that they come from that, um, the uh, viewfinder and, and extracting shapes and forms. Um, do they go through several processes from what you're seeing to that um, really abstract or are you abstracting them when you're sketching directly at the time? I I can show you. A, oh. Yeah. So if you see here, this was a sketch done. It was a poppy. So these were, yeah, I've knit, wrote, written all purples, quite fleshy. Um, and then this is the... the the card, the colour version of that. So mm. it's it's really, I can't uh, coordinate, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but it's really quite literal. And the um, things change a little bit as I'm as I'm working. So I don't have the sketch this came from. This mm. didn't necessarily come from a sketch. I have a few that are in progress here that I will be. Um, so these didn't come from anything really, but you can see that they are, they're natural forms mm. that will develop. So sometimes they are quite, you know, a simple um, <clears throat> transition from looking at something natural. Um, but then other times they will be from in my head, thinking about what's going on in the seasons. It's, mm. it always, landscape I walk my dog every morning and every evening on my own and I'm looking so that's twice a day on my own just looking at um, the vegetation in my local area and seeing the tiny tiny changes and you know maybe walking around one corner of a field and seeing the pattern of leaves that have fallen between morning walk and evening walk and then between Monday morning and the following Monday morning and seeing you know the way that the colours are changing as they are rotting down into the ground and um, you know an apple that's slowly being eaten by by mice or birds or, or whatever is eating an apple that has has fallen um, so I've got this constant input of shapes from nature and you know the way that surfaces change with with the weather all of these these details i think constantly go into my head and then mm. i will i mm. will regurgitate them when i'm um meditating on paper which is something else that i do at least twice a day is even if it's just a few strokes just to kind of um you know it's like people who 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 do some deep breathing every day i will do some calm down and paint, paint a few strokes. Uh, yeah, because I had um, somewhere written down on the notes about um, sometimes that you've described your process as train sketching mode and then yeah. you've got the sort of neat draftsman-like um, approach. So are they two different kind of speed dials that you set yourself on when working on something? Yeah, they are. I think that being on site is another um, thing that I'm doing where I'm greedily trying to get down as much information as possible so I'm not actually stopping to think and analyze um, but sometimes I'll be out in a place and that's all I'm doing I'm just you know I might spend half an hour just sitting and and being somewhere before I start recording and zooming in um, and that will tend to lead to me considering just one aspect of a place um, being on a train is is liberating in that I have I've only got what I fitted in my bag, which often will be just three pens and and a tiny sketchbook, and um, and then I'll have like three hours ahead of me, and I can really ah oh, this is so lovely. I, you know, I can't. There are so many 
tasks that um, will distract. So that's why one of the reasons I love being on a train. Mm. Um, and then in the studio, I have these these huge desks. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I have to do next week is to start painting fabric for a new project. Um, well, it's not a new project, it's a new collection of a, an existing collaboration. But um, that has a really a, another kind of head that's more more organized. Mm. So I've got another image here of um, so um, I've got this just down as ideas in the ideas category. Um, can you remember what this related to and where what that was extracted from? Like a study in what exactly? <laughs> Uh, I remember all, you could show me a hundred. <laughs> that was a stupid question, I, wasn't it? <laughs> they all, so this was using a, I had a viewfinder stuck on top of a, um, a magnifying glass and I had the magnifying glass in a um, clamped onto something and then I had a series of stones um, that were, you know, that I was looking at. So if you go back to the image, you can see that there are some um, marks that are um, the striations where two different types of stone have somehow, through whatever geological process, um, been melded together. And then there are other ones where um, granite has little bits of, um, of quartz or whatever I'm not great at <laughs> as stone um but yeah that's what it was and then I was also looking you know at first glance they all look like they are kind of browny maybe a bit of purplish gray and I was a bit like on a photograph you might turn up the color contrast um in your in your phone that's what I was doing in my head I was saying I'll take that mm. I'll take that um grayish amber and I'll raise it to a really vibrant orange. Um, and yeah, that's that's what was going on there. So I was really zooming in. I was looking at the textures and the the shapes of stones, and also I was juxtaposing them against each other. So they are not all sim single stones. Some of them are, um, you know, the relationship between one stone and another when they are placed next to each other. But I was looking at them as if I was in a landscape looking oh. at um, the edge of a cliff coming down to a pool um, you know maybe a canopy of trees adjacent to um, a sweeping view into the distance so I was kind of turning myself into a tiny tiny weeny um, yeah so kind of changing the perspective really of yeah. how you're seeing the actual thing into something else yeah hmm. so this idea of um multiples and repetition and annotation and how they help you see and understand concepts and I know that you use the word typology um so and that being a way of categorizing something do you always do you have like a go-to kind of typology when you're working like you kind of have categories on hand that you slot in and use depending on where you are or is it more in response to the actual place it's in response to the place. So I will, it's another one of these things where I'm, um, like I was saying earlier, where it's about compartmentalizing a mass of visual inputs or sensory inputs. So I might go to an area and the thing in that area could be columns and pediments around doors. So it depends where it is. Often it's the vernacular of architecture. So that could be about my trade or it could be that I studied architecture because I enjoy identifying things. So, you know, window types, tree mm. type, um, mm. people. It could be about picking out colours in a certain place. And I think that when you're looking at vegetation and going to um, planted spaces, then there is a, you know, a thing of identifying repeated forms repeated colors repeated patterns um so maybe that's a it's a game kind of thing maybe that's the collector yeah. i collect um inputs uh, and i think it leads, sorry 
I was going to say, I think it's quite common for designers. I'm sure you do it as well. I'm sure you look through a magazine and you'll be spotting um, use of typography or white space. Well, it makes me think of two things. One, that um, just if you've got the crop and you're kind of giving yourself that constraint of that space and not seeing something outside of it, by giving yourself, like you were saying, windows, um, because to me, if ever I've attempted to go outside and sketch, just trying to distill something because you're just like, the, it's so overwhelming being in that space, you kind of almost sometimes just get frustrated and pack up and leave because you can't possibly capture. So by giving yourself that window or saying, I'm only going to look for yellow or windows or pillars or, yeah, I mean, that just helps the starting point be established, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. It is about starting something so that the last thing you want is that you back up and walk away. Even if you don't, you're not actually drawing. Even if you just say to yourself, okay, what, what am I looking at here? Let's, let's just randomly pick out something. Let's look at the way light is, is moving across, uh, you know, across different subjects and how it's changing according to the the texture and the, you know, how damp something is, whether mm. there's dew in that area, it makes you observe mm. something. So you know, if you give yourself a task, then you will start thinking about things in a different, different way. And I love one of the other things that, you know, I think is great about the way you work, like you've got that observation thing, um, but then you've got the, um, the, the playing as well and, and coming up with another way of seeing things. So, can you tell us about the idea behind this? Because I'm assuming this is not a landscape or a building. No, it's not. But it's the it's the same sort of thing. It's a kind of I want to paint, but it's it's the sort of thing that I will do at night in my caravan. And I don't want to do something from my imagination. I just want to paint. And it's a it's like a it's like a helping hand or a teacher saying, "Here you are. Just colour that in." Um, yeah. So. This is, this is me um, throwing a few buttons onto a page, drawing around them where they land, and then throwing a few sticks onto a page, onto the same page and drawing around them and getting, getting the randomness. So as I describe it there, I'm um, reminded of the way that you, um, you know, you plant bulbs. You don't um, decide on a pattern. You just throw them, you toss them and, and you know, the act of, tossing a handful of daffodil bulbs onto the ground and just planting them where they land, uh, you create this sort of natural scatter um, or drift. And what I'm doing in a sketchbook, um, like the spread you've just shown, is just a, a painting version of that. Yeah. Um, there's loads of that kind of thing. And I think that that comes also from um, train travel and maybe the, the way I was brought up. Um, on long journeys in the back of a VW camper van with um, our parents just saying, you know, draw a picture of whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. The inside of a tennis ball mm. um, and then mm. throw in some ones. So, yeah. And we were talking um, earlier in the week about childhoods with um, games at birthday parties or making up games and, and all of that stuff. And I guess before... Um, in the age of where apps and things were shown at you, you kind of just made up your own thing. And, um, yeah, I, I've kind of enjoyed that as well, like that thing if you go to your creative space, you don't know where to start, but you just you just know and feel that you want to be creative, but you don't know where to start. So coming up with those little things is a great way of um, just suddenly um, centering yourself and bringing yourself to that space. And then once you're there and doing it may lead to something else, but, um, yeah. And the other thing I like about that is um, I didn't realise before um, I did one of your courses that this idea of separating out colours and putting them together so you're working with those set palettes and that is the, just the palette in front of you rather than just, um, you know, always having everything. I like that idea of just selecting just those pans and working with those. Um, yeah. I have some pans that just have four, some tins that have four colours in um, mm -hmm. with maybe um, 
20 odd colors in. Um, but also this tiny pans, they're great for going out and um, either um, having a limited palette and being traveling light, um, yeah. but also making you um, think about what's going down on the page. You know, if you are, I've, I have one of my projects that is, is in the future is, is um, a journal, a zine type journal. And I'm thinking about whatever um, we design, I'm collaborating with somebody on this um, and whatever we design in terms of the graphics and the illustrations um, will need to be printed and uh, I'd like it to be a really limited palette so that it's not um, too you know heavy on the carbon footprint of the publication and I think that if you if your starting point has a limited palette then it makes it easier to translate that you don't have to be quite as um, selective yeah, if, yeah definitely base to start with. Now, you and I were pretending that we were both a little bit nervous, so we're pretending that it's just you and I chatting. But um, I just want to <laughs> share, um, yes, Pam, I agree. It's fantastic to hear um, how Tansy arrives at that because it's just incredible. Thank you. <laughs> so, yes, thank you for that. Um, so back to one of these, can you, um, oh, that was that. What's... What, what's going on here? What what are you? <laughs> what are these notations doing? What I'm doing here is um, creating swatches of paper that will be used in when I'm back in the studio. And rather than making those swatches, so these these went into a collage um, or into several collages. Um, rather than creating those marked coloured bits of paper in the studio, by making them on site they are kind of like an artifact you know when you go on holiday Ooh. and you and you have and you take away um the tissue paper that the sweeties were wrapped in at the end of your <laughs> wonderful in rome and you get back to wherever you live and you've got that lovely artifact and it's like oh loveliness it reminds me of that happy time um well it's the same kind of thing you've got the the stimulus so on those little scraps of paper also, because they're loose scraps just taped temporarily to a page, there's no, um, there's no pressure to create a composition. I know that they will be torn up. Um, and often what I'm doing on those is just recording sounds. Sometimes I will, um, I'll write verbatim conversations that I hear, which is really good fun. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it, <laughs> it's a life to be, be no, nosy and, um, you know, now people in the botanical gardens will, if they see me, they'll go, no, let's stop talking. Yeah. <laughs> they, they also get torn up. They're not um, something that is directly um, used in, in an illustration of a place. But, um, yeah, they're kind of, they're components. They're like little sound bites or mm. like music that would be put into a, um, a piece of electronically produced music mm. and use, I'll quite often do a selection of marked swatches on site at the same time as doing um, something like that which is more about compositions and then when I'm recreating them so that illustration that you showed was me using the swatches that were created on site the one before this Oh, yes, the one before that. Was that one? Uh, no, no, no. The, oh, there no. Was one. We did that. That was something separate. Uh, those ones? No, it's a big oh. sketchbook with, um, with some collages in progress. And oh, the, col the layout of those collages um, comes from sketches. Oh, I know. I've, got, I've actually got the... Um, not the quintessential Tansy page. Oh, no, maybe this one? Yes. Yeah, that one. So, look, there is the – these are the sketches I have in my hand there. Um, mm. So I made those using a viewfinder and just literally with um, – I think I had a, a two thicknesses of black pen and green pencil, and that was just drawing what I could see. And at the same time as doing that, I had um, a load of Scott – swatches laid out where I was um, translating um, the sound of the water into different colours and 
making notes of um, conversations that I could hear. Um, and then when I got back to the studio, I used those collage bits of paper or pieces of, of paper to make the collages in the larger sketchbook. Mm. And because time is flying by. So also, um, as many people would know, that textiles is also one of your um, other things, that mediums that you work with. So does one inform the other or are they two separate distinct mediums? Because the um, approach is similar, mm -hmm. I guess, but then I guess you're treating the fabric in different ways to get it to that stage. Yeah, the I think the the detailed marks um, and compositions do relate to what I draw when I'm out and about. Um, but the where textiles come from for me is that early experimental construction thing you know what happens if I cover this with that so I started painting textiles and manipulating them when I was at architecture school and we had to make models mm. and I what I had available and because I I took my sewing machine from home with me to London when I went to university mainly to so that I could carry on making clothes but <laughs> I had a I had a stack of fabric. Also, it was the days of bros, and I earned a pound a patch by patching people's jeans and, you know, the other bows <laughs> their jacket. So I had this great scrap bag. So then, you know, that was like, okay, I've got these materials. We've got to make a model. Um, and I started painting fabric to make it stiff. So if you imagine, oh. you know, sample, I used to get match pots of emulsion from, um, B and Q, you know the the home uh, store yeah. nearby. And if you paint emulsion onto denim, you get a really malleable. But it's Ooh. quite you know you can actually cut up, you can cut up walls of buildings, and you can you can arch roofs and create um, all sorts of wonderful forms. And that's where that started. And so um, it's a little bit like. Um, it's like there are two lines going on. There's the, the construction manipulation using textiles in that way. And then me being out and sketching and painting and my textiles and how they look are the, where those two lines cross over. Mm, and I like how you, because I believe that this sort of unpick and repurpose and rework um, I feel like this is your um, signature colour palette as well. But, um. Yeah, <laughs> it is in green. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Or maybe I should just <laughs> have a go at other... So this is part... Actually, I have here what that turned into. Ooh, so, drum roll. Oh, my this, goodness. This, yeah. Wow, Joseph, Technicolor Dream Jacket. Wow. Yeah. So this is a collaboration I'm working on with, um, has it got the label in, hang on, with Sanna, Sanna Patrick, in Ger who's a fashion designer in Germany. Hang on. Jeez, that, wow, yes, okay, oh, yep. Cool. Mm -hmm. So this is where I'm exploiting, so these are all bits of old clothing, so it's all about the circular economy and um, sustainability and reusing and repurposing uh, rather than um, buying new raw materials um, and creating forms using those repurposed um, bits of cloth. So I think here with this project, I'm going back to the idea of, of creating form 3D objects um, rather than um, entirely 2D. Mm. So, and that's, I have lots of ideas at the moment of um, 3D things that I'm, I'm wanting to do. I'm exhibiting yeah. in. I was just going to say, like, on my piece of paper here, it says, how do you decide what to focus on each day or week? Or is it a case of kind of deadline driven and what's due that week? Or so many things to explore. Uh, at the moment, it's definitely deadline driven. Um, when it's when I haven't got hard, a load of hard deadlines, then um, often it will be about the weather or about my walk or, or how I'm feeling. Um, 
yeah I just let myself respond to you know what I'm feeling sometimes mm. I want to be quiet and slow and sometimes I'm excited about starting something new uh, mm. and yeah. speaking of new good segue because I feel like a large part of your um uh you know you kind of seem uh to take on so many personas um and one of them seems to be inventor because I do have your um uh viewfinder thing here because I just thought that was genius idea but now you've created your own watercolors so I mean just being able to name them would have been like reason one but um yeah can you tell us a bit more about how that came about uh well I buy loads and loads of watercolors I've got a lot so I'm a real consumer of watercolors and I do get through them because I I paint you know you you probably only see a fraction of what I do so then doing my online courses I have lots of people saying where do you get your lovely watercolors from so I'm I spent a while telling people you know the all the places that I buy them and I just started thinking number one this is this is an opportunity. I could I could make my own watercolor paints. You know, I like I like cooking. I like making clothing. I like making things for myself. You know, I'd rather make bread, a loaf of bread and make my own chutney than go to the supermarket. Um, and so I thought, yeah, I could actually. It's a lot more expensive to just make your own paint, but if I could make paint and sell it, then I could get other people to pay for my desire to make my own paint. So I thought, yeah, I could make my own paint and share it with all these lovely people who are asking me where my paint comes from. Mm -hmm. The other thing that in exploring other people's handmade paints, I'm, I've learned a lot about the, the tiny differences between opacities that are possible in paint and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, granulation and, and different colors and pigments. So. I'm definitely somebody who, when I get into something, I re I really in research the backstory. Just naturally, I want to I want knowledge. So I've learned a lot about pigment, and I just thought this is of this is pointing to me making my own range of paints. And it's taken eighteen months. I now have a um, a paint having formulated, having done the exciting bit of formulating them and making the colours. Um, now the hard work is happening of and it's happening you can see behind me the um yeah pots, pots. Of pigments and things so i have a paint maker working with me in the studio now who has taken over um and is doing the the hard work bit so i'm and often, these are watercolors they're watercolors yeah Did you see the, my my tin here so they are they're watercolors in pans so this is my experimental or my test so this is the range and these are my test paints, um, which are almost, some of them are almost gone, yeah. Um, so they are, um, they're just solid, they're not in tubes, and um, they will be, they're done. And I ran a competition recently, and I'm about to send out um, a full set to the winner, and then individuals to um, the runners-up. But they'll be available in my shop um, from next week. They are, um, my shop's relaunching this evening, having had a couple of me. Um, uh, I wanted a summer break and I've extended it to November uh, because I've just taken on other products and things. Uh, so that's where I'll be selling the viewfinder clipboard that you showed. They, that's being relaunched um, for sale. So the designing that, being an inventor, as you said, is a bit like being a landscape architect. Um, but it's so much quicker if you <laughs> if you have to, and that's why it just didn't you know the knowledge of landscape and exploration and design and so on really suits me but I'm too impatient and I um my attention span is not a pro good enough for to be a, a landscape architect because projects they take like you know five six seven years oh, and they've more. got to build they've got to grow <laughs> Well, you, you know, there'll be a design that will be put forward and then there's funding to be gained and then permissions and conditions and contractors to, to work with and so on. So my viewfinder clipboard was my response as a designer to a problem um, 
And I solved that problem with this design and then I shared it with people. So it's about having juggling a viewfinder um, or a set of viewfinders, yeah. a sketchbook and somewhere to put your pens. And this is the idea is this is all held in one place. So you could have your basically your mobile art studio in one hand and you can have your other hand free so that you can balance as you are walking across some stepping stones across a river um, and you know or, or climbing up a up a slope yeah so, it's brilliant and, and going back to the I mean I yes I, I absolutely loved it which is why I had to have one um, and the, but going back to the colors so was naming them as fun as it seems or was that actually just like did they do speak to you as you were using them or was it just like, oh, uh, mm. <laughs> oh, no, def it was definitely fun. And some of them were paints that I wanted to have a color that was exactly that color. So it was like the name came first. Right. Yes. So I wanted a tansy. I wanted a <laughs> caravan. And so I was mixing and I was like, oh, I need a little bit more Hansa yellow light in that. Or, um, you know, it was the the the, color, the name started and then other ones um like pretty in pink it was just a color that was lovely and it was yummy as I was making it and then it was a case of what what should we call this and like school disco um was called bubblegum but then it was slightly too blue for bubblegum and then I remembered um some hair extensions that my daughter had for her first school disco um, I think she was seven um, and they were exactly the same shade. So yeah. when I release them, I'm going to put photographs explaining where the names come from. Right. So names are a little bit more um, obvious uh, than others, like um, Marigold is very obvious um, than um, maybe Duomo or Byzantium or Letter More Pete. These will all have explanations, but they're all very personal. So is tansy purple or turquoise? Tansy yeah. is tansy oh. is is yellow. It's a it's yeah. the flower. Right. Um, but also yellow is um, for me, and I think for many many people, um, tans uh, yellow is the expression of happiness. So that's certainly. And so, all looking at all these colours, like, how do you feel about black? I like black. I wear black a lot. <laughs> uh, and I will have a pop of colour with black. And, um, yeah, I use black. I, I use black in my in my art as well, but it, it, it's something that is, is used to um, define or to bring out other colours. Mm -hmm. And so we're nearly out of time. And... I mean, you were kind of mentioned that sort of idea of meditative state. Um, so is that how you recharge? Like what inspires you and how do you recharge? Um, I charge by not having anything to write with. So going for a walk with just <laughs> my dog's lead so that I, I'm like, no, stop it. Put all the paint down, put the fabric down. You, you ha can't write any notes. Also, I swim. And um, mm -hmm. when I'm just going under the water and up and under and up and under and up and listening to the noise. So I still can't help myself translating the sound and the, the sort of sensory physical experience of swimming, say, into something visual. But it's definitely recharging. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I love chopping vegetables and mm. I don't and every night at all. Um, I'm really lucky that I don't have to do that, but I do really enjoy it. So I cooked a meal the other night and afterwards I felt um, recharged. Mm. I know what you mean about the um, stopping. I had to go through stages of not taking a bag so I couldn't pick anything up and do my pocket finds like those things behind me because it was like no you don't need another banksia just leave just leave <laughs> it walk away um and then that idea that you create that visual memory anyway without having to constantly photograph or pick up things and trusting that you 
already know what the response is, but yes. Oh, so almost last question. Um, what are you looking forward to or what are you working on? Is, and is that the collaboration or do you have beyond that? Oh, I have so many things. So <laughs> the uh, short term, I'm looking forward to doing some painting. Um, and that, you know, in, in a couple of hours, I'm going to do a little bit of painting, maybe just treat myself for an hour. Um, my shop reopening this evening. So um, I think it's going to be 8 p.m. UK time. I will press the relaunch button. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be at the Knitting and Stitching Show in Harrogate in the UK, which is from the um, Thursday, the 17th of November until Sunday, um, whatever date that makes it. Um, and, uh, and I'll be selling basically sketching tools, everything that a textile maker mm -hmm. needs in their studio to help them as a designer or a visual organiser. Um, and I'll be selling a few how-to guides, which I'm still writing, um, you know, how to use a viewfinder, how to um, create a thumbnail grid. And then I'm going to Germany at the end of November where I'll be... Mm -hmm launching my collection with Santa Patrick at a Christmas market in Ludwigsburg um, where I'll be doing a sketching workshop as well fantastic um, yeah and then we'll be at the other art fair in March in London um, next year and um, mm -hmm. and I'm at the University of South Dakota where I'm exhibiting um, in mm -hmm. early April so well, thank God we know how to recharge then, because that sounds like a busy schedule up ahead. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I need to take a breath now because this has been, and, you know, thank you so much. I know people have just loved all of um, what you've shared and your processes and the stories behind. Um, so on behalf of everybody that was uh, flashing up all their thanks at the time when you were speaking, I didn't want to interrupt your flow, but, um, yeah, oh. I mean, it's so generous to, to share all that and hear your stories. Um, so, yes, everybody, I'm going to just play the outro. Thanks, everyone, and especially Tansy for joining us. It's been great. And if you'd all like to pop your comments in the thing, now is the time. And, yes, um, have a great week. Thank you, Tara. It's been lovely. <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh, is it happening now? No, not that one. This one.